Um, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, trustees, academics, your students, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to the first Wells, uh, annual Wells Management Forum here at Regents University London. My name is Tatiana Doronina and I'm the Student Union President here. I'm greatly honored to have this opportunity to say a few words before our new Vice Chancellor Jeff Smith uh, will open the conference and address you. Uh, the Wealth Management Forum is an annual event organized by the Faculty Center for Applied Finance and Banking at Regents University London under the leadership of Dr. Jacob Schmidt and Professor Gianfranco Vento in cooperation with the Student Union. Here the short overview of the proceedings. Our Vice Chancellor, Jeff, Jeff Smith, will open the conference. Thereafter, we'll have a paper presentation by three distinguished speakers, Dr. Jacob Smith, um, who is a senior lecturer in finance and investment, professional with almost 30 years experience, will speak about the historic contents of 1929, followed by the Professor Yvonne Carini of the University of Graz and Alex Chartres, investment director at Ruffers Investments. A break for drinks and networking uh, will take place next door in room H202. After the break, we'll continue with a panel discussion with Q&A, uh, moderated by my colleague Alex Abid. Uh, he's the Vice President of Academic Affairs at the Student Union, uh, where three previous speakers will be joined by Ian Morley uh, of Wentworth Hall Family Office. Prof Professor Gianfranco Vento will make closing remarks. Uh, the event will be filmed uh, and will be available on the YouTube and Regents University websites. Enjoy the event and now delighted to call out new Vice Chancellor, Professor Jeff Smith, to open the fourth annual Wealth Management Forum. Please applaud. Thank you. I want to make two confessions up front. Firstly, I'm a professor of music, so I know nothing about wealth management. I singularly failed to create a life of my royalties. And secondly, I'm leaving at 5.30 sharp for another engagement. Please don't, don't misinterpret that early departure. Um, so as Tatiana said, I have the privilege of being the Vice Chancellor and Chief Exec of Regents University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event this afternoon. Um, it's organized by Regents Center for Applied Finance and Banking. Uh, what, what, what I like about that centre is it's really interested in where the theoretical and the practical meet. Um, we want to encourage discourse between ac academia and practice, and that nexus feels very regents and it feels very important. Um, the centre does many things. It organises these annual fora, it publishes papers, working papers, it supervises doctoral students, uh, and it facilitates professional seminars, so please you know, tune in, link in, get involved. I should say also this presentation was brought to you in collaboration with our students' union, so thank you Tatiana and uh, Alex for your huge support. Um, so, centre run by my colleagues Professor Gianfranco Vento and Jacob Smith. Uh, this is the fourth annual forum, I understand. Each year has had a theme. This one is about um, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Crash, what happened, uh, whose fault was it, what role did the speculators play, the bankers, the central bankers, uh, could it happen again, and above all, you know, what, what have we learned? We are privileged to have um, a great lineup of speakers. Dr. Schmidt himself, he's been an academic at Regents here, I think, since 2002. Ex City Group portfolio manager, derivatives expert, wealth management chief investment analyst, uh, and so on. Professor Karimi, uh, full professor of international law, really distinguished international profile studies in Austria and Israel. Many publications, including on space law. Is space law a thing? Space, space law is a thing. Uh, Alex Chartre from uh, Ruffa, investment director the well-respected £25 billion international investment firm. Um, if you haven't got a copy of this, grab one. Um, there's a lovely quote. Anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. <laughs> 
highly recommend the Ruffer Review. Uh, and Ian Morley, successful business angel and entrepreneur, chairman of Wentworth Hall, family office and consultancy, chairman of a number of medical healthcare groups, NED at Conister Bank, various directorships in property, in Asian lending, in blockchain, in cryptocurrencies. I'm not sure what Ian does in his spare time. Um, so, as Tatiana said, the f game of two halves, really. Presentations, tea break, panel discussion, uh, with some closing remarks from Professor Vento. So, thank you for joining us, students, academics, researchers, industry practitioners, uh, and I look forward to learning something. <coughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor Jeff, for opening the conference. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, for uh, supporting us, for working together as in previous years. It's a pleasure. Um, so I've, I've been working at Regents University here as an academic, as a researcher, as a lecturer for many, many years. But what's my interest in 1929? Why are we doing this conference? I think simply because Number one, it's 90 years since this very important date in history. This was probably, in financial markets, the most shocking event until 10 years ago when we had the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. So a very important date in history that we cannot ignore. Okay? Um, but as an academic, as an investment professional, I've always had an interest in financial crisis. Why? Because when you're an investor, then you're hit by financial crisis because you're invested. And the markets go down or your investments turn sour. So you need to look at it. You need to be aware of that. As a researcher, as an academic, I'm always very interested because this is, an, this is a once-in-a-lifetime event that we had. So we have to understand it and we have to analyze it in order to learn from that. As you know, if you don't learn from history, history might repeat, we might have to go through that again. Uh, I completed my PhD a few years ago in 2017 on the subject of the role of speculators in major market crises. That was because when I started my PhD late in life, because I was before that I was much more in, involved in markets on a daily basis as a trader, uh, that was shortly after the global financial crisis, <coughs> and I felt research into 2008, 2009 would be important. And then I came to the conclusion there were many crises before, and in particular to, uh, 1929. And we can discuss of to what extent you can compare it, but 1929 is very important. And you can't compare it, you can compare it. Um, so I did uh, extensive research on the uh, historical analysis and comparison of the role of speculators so hedge funds, banks, leveraged institutions, and so on, in the crashes of 1929-2008. Most recently, I published two working papers on 1929, and I'm planning more research on 1929 out of my dissertation, out of my research, and of course on 2008. But I do a lot of research on other aspects, for example, on sustainability and so on. But, but that is very close to my heart. Just a few words here about what I call the short history of financial market crisis in the 20th and 21st century. So to that 20, 1929, the Great Crash and then the Great Depression was obviously <coughs> a major event. But after that, unfortunately, we had many other crises and mini, mini crises. For example, Black Monday, some of you might remember that. The older among us, the younger, probably more from, uh, from the history books. But some of us remember that when actually Wall Street collapsed again in, uh, in, in, uh, in the fall of uh, 19, uh, uh, 1987, uh, <coughs> and, and the, the, it was, an, it was a short-lived but very, very uh, uh, um, heavy fall in the markets. Then we had the tequila crisis in 1994-95 when Mexico defaulted and uh, uh, spread over, and it was a major crisis. Short-lived, it was a major crisis, the debt crisis. Then the Asian flu in 1997, Russian LTCM in 1998, then the internet bubble followed by the credit crisis of Enron and WorldCom in 2000, 2003, 
And then finally, 2008, the global financial crisis, which lasted short, but it was, very, it was a major shock. And it was comparable in a way to 1929 um, and led then to the Great Recession. So we had the Great Depression after 1929, uh, which lasted for 10 years, and we had the Great Recession after 2008, 2009, which lasted for shorter. So now we have similar heavy shocks, but much shorter lived than that. Um, so where do we start here? What I want to do is I want to give you an overview of the historic context of that, what happened before, during, and after this great crash. So what was this great crash? This great crash was an, the, an element of the culmination, the peak of speculation. As I told you earlier, I'm interested in speculators. I think they are fascinating because they want to make money and they are supposed to be clever. They're supposed to have superior knowledge. That are what I did in my PhD uh, research, which I don't talk here so much about it, but it's like they are supposed to have superior knowledge to be better and so on. So in my research, I look at that and are they really better and so on. Here we want to talk more about what happened in 1929, what led to 1929 to the, to the, to the, to the peak, and then what uh, happened thereafter. Uh, so, so, so the market crash of 1929 is really considered a unique, what we call in statistics or in finance, a five sigma event. That means it hap it's a very slim chance that it happens, okay? But it happens. And there are many people who research that and they know that, they know, you might have read of a famous book by Nassim Taleb a few years ago, who talks about the black swan, okay? How likely is it is a black swan, okay? We say black swans are very unlikely. But then they happen, there are more, more black swans than we think out there. The same with crisis, as I showed you earlier, with these mini crises that we had since 1929. Uh, so we think that these five sigma events only happen once in a lifetime, okay? Um, but then the mini crises happen more often, okay? So once in a lifetime, 1929, and 79 years later, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, the problem is with these heavy shocks is that they might take you out of business. You, just, you might just kind of lose everything. And that's what happened in 1929. I'm going to speak about that. Um, the 1920s, as the Vice Chancellor said earlier, were also called the Roaring 1920s. Okay? It was like, it were called the Golden 1920s, in particular in the US. Amazing innovation, good spirit after the war. The United States were not affected by that. So it was very roaring. Okay? Equity markets were booming, lots of speculation. But there were a series of stru structural issues that we're going to discuss. Uh, so, so in Europe, we felt these consequences of this brutal war, the first time, the, the, the Great War, later called the First World War, because unfortunately, 20 years later, we had the Second World War. And so, on. so in Europe, we suffered from the consequences of the brutal war. Um, and then came the market crash of 1929, which really took people out of their foundations and was shocked the world, okay? Uh, so what I want to cover here is I want to speak a little bit about the, uh, the, the geographic, the, the, the differences between what happened in Europe and what happened in the US, and then potentially how can we explain it, what do people uh, uh, say about that? As an academic, I have to look at some sources, okay? We cannot just make things up, okay? So some of the sources, some of the literature that I studied and that I find important. The first one is probably uh, the most important source of information that you can get because let's not forget 1929, 90 years ago. There's nobody, hardly anybody left to, who lived back then. And the people who lived back then are now probably centenarians, okay, are over 100 years old, and then even then they would have been only 10 years old. So there's, a very, there's an amazing document, a series of documents, called the Commission Reports from 1931, 32, <coughs> 33, and 34. Over 10,000 pages of documents, which are available because the Federal Reserve, Saint, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, one of the 10 Federal Reserve Banks in the Federal Reserve System in the US published now all these, not just published, they scanned all the documents and made them available on the internet and you can study them. 10,000 pages, amazing. 
Because after the crash, the US Senate decided to set up a committee on banking, or there was a committee on banking and currency, and they got a mandate to investigate that. Very important investigation. These investigations lasted for several years. And then they came out with this, the final document, which was the Commission Report of 1934. So they published papers over a few years. In 1934 was the final document, 400 pages of conclusions. Before that is all the sources, all the interviews, all the bankers and so on, they interviewed and so on. Very interesting uh, uh, information that you can get. Lots of details about who did what and what was the role of the banks and the central banks and the feds and the politicians and so on. Okay? Another very interesting document is a document on the role of the banks. It, that's all in the, in, on, in the US. It's called the Statistical Data of 1931 where actually they looked at the banks and what happened at the banks. And then, as you know, there was a banking crisis after the crash of 1929. There was a banking crisis in, in the US in 1931 and in other parts of the world and so on. Very important document. Um, then a more readable book. Very, I don't know whether anybody has, has seen it or has read it. It's The Great Crash of 1929 by J.K. Gilbreth. Okay, like, very important. He wrote it in 1954 okay, because he was asked to do a history of what happened to that uh, because nobody had done that. Nobody had described it. He also consulted some kind of sources and so on. And so on. It's very interesting, very readable, very short, only 150 pages. It's very interesting. It gives his opinion. We're going to refer to that later. Another very inter interesting uh, uh, source is uh, Milton Friedman's uh, Monetary History of the United States of 67 until 1960, where he actually analyzed the banking system in the US from 67, which was after the Civil War in, 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 the, in, in, in the US, until 1960. Okay, very interesting. And he discusses in particular monetary institutions policies, in particular about 1929. And I'll give you some insight into that a little bit later. And then, for me, a, an amazing uh, a theory that Hyman Minsky developed in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that he calls the financial instability hypothesis. He calls it a hypothesis, but it's really a theory already with, uh, uh, with, um, with some kind of conclusion what happened. So that's also very interesting from a theoretical point of view uh, um, document that we can look at. Um, so now over to the historic background of the Great Crash of 1929. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about, first about the gold standard, then about some European countries, Germany, United Kingdom, France, and China, and the Soviet Union, and then we talk about the US. It's really the US I'm interested in, because the US was the center of speculation, but we need to understand what is the global context and, and so on. Um, so the 1920s, as I said earlier, were really called the golden 20s, but they had a, a series of structural issues, okay? So we had the US, which recovered from the global crisis, but was not involved in the war. Europe, which really came back out of the war, okay? Uh, uh, countries changed their legal structure. Germany became the Weimar Republic. Austria, an empire, suddenly became a small country. Lots of different new countries. France, United Kingdom, the, the, the British Empire became smaller, and I think we're still becoming smaller every day here. I think this seems to have been lasting for the last 100 years, unfortunately. Um, uh, so, 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 so there were real, real uh, uh, changes in the world out there. Okay. Um, uh, the Versailles Treaty, the negotiations about the reparation payments of Germany versus the Allied forces, uh, was very tough on Germany. Uh, Keynes, who was a part of the negotiating team, had warned that the heavy burden of the reparation duty on the German economy would be too heavy. Okay, so it's very interesting. He is a Brit. He understood that. Okay, France was in a transition transition from the agricultural to an industrialized nation. Um, Great Britain, as I said earlier, went through the structural change, in particular the booming textile sectors and so on which started to falter, and then the Soviet Union in China, which we're going to talk about it in a second. Okay. Uh, 
the US, as I said, had uh, entered the war very late, the First World War, I mean here, and were not impacted by this. So they came out um, um, relatively uninfected, okay, and, and, and then there was a lot of innovation in, in, in the United States. The gold standard. The gold standard is very important to understand what happened there. Why is that? Because before, before the First World War, many countries had anchored their currencies towards gold and some towards silver. And that was the idea of how to run a currency, okay? to have a, an anchor towards that. During the First World War, most countries abolished that because they said, look, we have to, we have to raise your money. We can no longer have this stringent, this kind of straight jacket here. And after the First World War, they discussed it again. So in the 1920s, they wanted to reintroduce the gold standard. It means every country would have gold reserves and would only have a certain monetary mass, money in circulation that is linked to the gold. Okay? Uh, initially, the idea was to do this early as 1922. There was an international <coughs> conference that recommended the reintroduction, but it was delayed because Germany suffered from hyperinflation. It wasn't ready yet. Okay? Germany, remember, the empire, uh, uh, the Reich uh, had collapsed, became a republic. They were not involved in the negotiations, so in, in Versailles, they were just like the Austrians were only asked to come into the negotiations at the end after the final statement and so on. Very different from the big, big mistake, <coughs> we understand that. Okay, so the gold standard was introduced later, not in, 20, not in 1922, but in 1926, first in, in the UK, um, uh, and then in France, and in Germany and so on. The problem was that and then, of course, the United States of America. The problem was that some countries, for example, the United Kingdom, still had this idea of being superior. And they wanted to have a strong currency, which led to overvaluation. Okay, so they, they linked it uh, to, to, the, to, to gold. And uh, by, by definition, because all countries had gold reserves and had anchored their currencies versus gold, um, that created a fixed exchange rate. So the pound, I had a value of the, the, the ex exchange rate pound sterling to dollar was one to 4.82 dollars, which was approximately 10, 15 percent overvalued. Okay, so pound was overvalued, dollar was undervalued by that measure. Um, France, by contrast, uh, devalued its currency, the franc, uh, and uh, had an advantage out of that. They also, the analysis shows that actually they actually acquired more gold than necessary, which led to some distortions in the, in the gold market. Um, so, so, so the gold, gold standard and the anchoring of gold, of the currency versus gold, was, was a problem that led to distortions, which ultimately then led to an international uh, trend to invest in the United States of America because of the undervaluations and because of the hype over there. Um, and, and countries really only then departed from the gold standard between 1929 all the way to 1933, 36. Some countries kept the gold standard much longer than others. Others gave it up, okay? And then obviously at the end, the end of this story was then 1944. During the war, the last year, last days of the war when International powers came together and in Bretton Woods started the new Bretton Woods system that would actually link the currencies to the dollar, which again was convertible into gold. Okay, so there was a new system. The central banks would not necessarily have gold themselves, but would be convertible into, into, into um, uh, would be linked to the dollar, and the dollar would be convertible into gold. They had these gold reserves. What about Germany? The crisis in Germany. So Germany did not have a speculative uh, uh, stock market, bull market like, um, like the US, which we're going to talk about in a second, because they had other issues. Okay? They came out of the war, hyperinflation, political instability, lots of different governments and so on. So there was no uh, um, speculation on the German exchanges. But Germans, those who were wealthy, speculated by actually investing into mainly the US market. Uh, the United Kingdom, again, um, 
had a little bit of speculation here, but the majority of the speculation again happened by uh, UK investors uh, investing into the into the uh, uh, US stock market. Uh, the famous people, for example, Winston Churchill, who lost a fortune in 1929. He loved the stock market, he loved to speculate, it he lost a fortune back then. And funnily enough, he was in, in the US uh, during the crisis in October of 1929, and he was a witness of, actually, he witnessed when he lost the fortune uh, in, 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 in these days, in the Great Crash. Um, uh, France. Um, France, uh, like Britain, France, uh, there was not much, much speculation going on in France, but more French investors again speculating, going overseas and speculating in the, in the US. Um, um, the French franc was, as I said earlier, was undervalued and the country had massive reserves had a problem because on the one hand they owed money to the United States of America but had claims, reparation claims versus Germany which was this instability in, in Europe um, um, but, but, but had because of its gold reserves was within the European context uh, a, 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 a lender of gold to other central banks. Okay? And in 1931, when the Austrian credit ad start, which was one of the major crises in, 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 the, in, the, in the banking uh, field, uh, collapsed, the French got involved and in lent money to the Austrians, or lent gold to the Austrians to, to help them. Um, then China. Okay. China, back then, was not a wealthy country, not like today. Uh, and it was definitely not wealthy enough to anchor its currency to gold but they chose the more affordable silver standard. Okay? Silver, by the way, was also an anchor to the dollar in the 1860s, 1870s. Okay? So China decided to use silver as a standard. Uh, the Soviet Union, uh, um, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union uh, had, due to the revolution in 1917, uh, again other issues. Okay, there was a ch political change over there going on, the transition from a, from an, from a capitalist uh, 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 or quasi-capitalist country to a socialist command economy. Okay? And it isolated the Soviet Union from the rest of the world. Uh, in the early days, between 1921 and 1926-27, there was a quasi-capitalist uh, 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 experiment going on, the new economic policy, NEP, that allowed some ownership of assets in the early days of communism, which then in 1927 was abolished. Okay? Uh, the real crisis in, in the Soviet Union was a hunger crisis in 1932-33 because of the misallocation of resources and so on. Very, very painful. Um, and because of this hunger crisis, people moved to the towns and so on. So again, was not really affected by speculation, only then secondary effects uh, after 1929 uh, in the global context. So now, now to the main focus of where the, where the crisis happened, the, the great crash of 1929 happened, the United States of America. Uh, so the U.S. was hit hardest by the global, by the Great Crash, because this is where the, 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 the speculation had occurred between 1924, and you will see in a second here, when I come up with my way of, uh, of, 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 of grouping that, okay, between 24 and 28 and 29. Mm. Um, so it was hit the hardest, okay? Ultimately, it, le it led them together with... Um, with the, with, with the speculation, the banking crisis, and so on, the Great Depression, which lasted for 10 years, as I said earlier. Um, so in the early days, uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, so, so we've been 1921, 1920, 1929, we had uh, quite a positive development, economic development in, in, in the US, uh, interrupted by short, uh, uh, short periods of of recession, 
Okay, so these were mini recessions, and I'll show you a chart a little bit later about that. Okay, um, in general, these were happy times. Some people suffered, not everybody participated in that. Again, it's like today, we have a booming economy, but not everybody participates. In particular, uh, white uh, farmers, Native Americans, and Afro Americans did not prosper. Okay, the rest of the population had a good time. Okay, they prosper, they, they, in particular in the towns in New York, in Chicago, and so there's a lot of development going on. Um, Friedman, Milton Friedman, this, describes the period of 1923 to 29 as a period of relati relatively steady growth, interrupted by two short, rather mild recessions from May 23 to July 24, and October 26 to November 27. Macro data shows that the number of manufacturing establishments grew from 133,000 to 206,000. So a lot of innovation, a lot of startups going on. Output increased from 60 billion to 69 billion. And the Federal Reserve index of industrial production went from 67 in 29 to 119.25 into 126 in 29. So if we, if we believe in that, then it shows that the economy is doing well between 1920 and 1929. Economic growth, okay? Imports rose, capital was exported, and the US stock market turned bullish, okay? So there was a very positive development over there. But there was also a trend for getting rich quickly. Firstly, via the real estate market, I'm going to speak about that in a second, in Florida, and then later via the stock market. So the, the question here is really, was the stock market cheap or expensive at the beginning and then at the end? Most commentators agree that the stock market was very cheap in the early 1920s. Um, and that really led then in 1924, after this initial you know, recovery, okay, to this five-year bull market. Okay, initially a mild bull market, and then in 28, 29, a kind of violent bull market. I'm going to say in a second. Um, in terms of monetary policy, the Federal Reserve was set up in 1913, the Central Bank of the, of the United States of America. But it really received a new chapter with more responsibility in 1922, and then between 22 and 29, and then later on, developed tools and mechanism of how to get involved. That is important to, to remember, because before 19, 1913, there was no central bank in the United States of America. Banks operated without a kind of a supervision and perhaps lend of last resorts, which are the two main functions of a central bank, if I may say. <coughs> Um, but really only in 1922, it got a new, a new charter and then started developing its tools and so on. We're going to talk about that, whether they had enough tools and were uh, uh, experienced enough to, to face the, the, the speculation and the crisis. Um, a few words about Florida and the stock, uh, not the stock market, about the property market. As you know, in the United Kingdom, we like the property market. We like to buy property. We like to speculate in property. Okay? But as we say, as already King Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Okay? Even speculation in the, in the property market is not new. So in the 1920s, early 20s, Americans discovered that Florida is a beautiful state. Why is it beautiful? Because the sun is shining and because property was cheap. And lots of New Yorkers wanted to spend more time in Florida, like today. We like to go to Florida, we like to spend our time over there. So people started actually buying property up there, over there, and a lot of speculation in the property market started. Um, many people actually were not even interested in really buying property and moving there, but just buying property rights, okay? so-called binders. Okay? These were like derivatives. You would have to make a down payment of 10%. And you would have a binder. You would get some documents of what you would own. Okay? And you would buy some kind of land somewhere in Florida where there were not even streets. There was no, uh, no water, no electricity, nothing. Okay? Just a plot of land. The farmers liked to do that because they sold these land expensively. And people speculated. 
1926, the property market started to collapse. People lost the fortune, uh, which led actually to a huge uh, contraction in the banking system over there. Um, and the farmers bought back the land cheaply. Okay, so they were the clever speculators. Okay, they sold it expensively to uh, New York uh, and other global uh, uh, or American global investors and then bought it back because it was actually really just a piece of paper. Um, interesting that in 1929, uh, 21 to 26, there was a famous speculator called Charles Ponzi. Uh, you know, Ponzi from the Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is something where you actually speculate in something, but it's hot air. Okay, so Charles Ponzi was involved in uh, postal vouchers and also in the property market over there. Um, and um, he got then prosecuted, was in jail, and then came back in other days. So, so that was one name also that popped up there. Okay, so after the, this real estate boom and the crash in Florida in 1926, uh, property market was kaput. Okay, it was dead. Okay, in Florida, but it didn't affect the rest of the United States of America. Investors just moved on and said there's a much better market to speculate, which is the stock market. Um, and people started speculating and buying shares in the stock market. Um, one of the reasons why the stock market was popular was number one, because interest rates were relatively low. People could borrow money to buy stocks, which is called leverage, which is called buying on margin. Lots of margin buying over there, okay? And because of the distortion in between Europe, the currencies over there, and, and the United States of America. Um, but also the stocks seemed inexpensive because of all the innovation going on in the United States of America. There were lots of radio was a new technology, then television, um, there were there were the the, the, uh, uh, the way to communicate stock prices, so people could actually have up-to-date stock prices because of the telegraphs and so on. Would be so suddenly people could buy stocks. They didn't have to be based in New York and on Wall Street, but could be anywhere in the country. We would see the ticker and we'd see what the prices are, and started getting excited about that. I would say very similar to today in the cryptocurrencies and in some other elements where people actually getting very excited about them and think this is something I should get involved. But really in 1928, Go Goldberg writes, the nature of the boom changed. So suddenly in 28, stocks didn't just go up, they went up a lot. There were new instruments out there that people started to speculate in. Two main instruments. One were so-called investment trusts. These were closed-ended funds that would be launched on the stock exchange and people would buy. So rather than buying individual titles, you would suddenly buy funds, portfolios, with 500 to 1,000 titles in these funds. Unbelievable today, because today a fund would have 20 stocks, 50 stocks, 100 stocks. 100 stocks is really quite diversified. But they had 500 to 1,000 stocks, so everything was in there. They put everything in there. And they used leverage in these investment trusts in a specific way by actually structuring preferred shares and common shares. And the preferred shares would actually take up the money and so on. And the second structure called holding companies were actually mm, uh, 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 the, the companies, holding companies would dominate underlying industries by actually owning the shares and, 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 and issuing preferred shares to the investors. <coughs> So these two as, as main characteristics of that. Um, in terms of politics, we had uh, Calvin Coolidge, who was the president between 1923 and 1928. Hoover got elected in, uh, in November of 1928 and took office in 1929. And Coolidge said, he lived through this amazing time and said, this will continue. There was an, uh, an idea of this would continue forever. Uh, he was later criticized for his lack of, of analysis and ignorance of the kind of speculation that was going on. Um, the stock market really became overheated in 1929. So we had 24 to 28, bull market started, 
lots of people got involved and so on. And then at the a at late 28 and 29, even the bellboys, even the cleaners, even the, sh the, the shoe shiners would know more about the market <laughs> than, than the professionals and so on. There's also a lot of other things going on, criminal activity uh, that I focus on in, in, in other papers that I've written and so on. But there's a lot of pool activity, criminal activity, tax evasion and so on going on that actually fueled this, okay? Lots of insider trading going on where the insiders had more information and the man in the street who just looked at the ticker thought this was a good stock and so on. Lots of pushing of stocks, what we would call today boiler room activities and so on. In 29, it really started getting out of hand. Uh, in March of 1929, the market corrected and people started getting worried. The, the uh, uh, Citibank, not the Citibank of today, but the previous National Citibank of, of New York and others actually ignored the warnings of the Fed. We said, this is a good correction, don't get involved. They got involved, they lent money at very low rates and started buying shares in the market and so on, which turned with, after a short correction in March of 1929, market came back and continued roaring through the summer all the way to, to, uh, um, to uh, October of 1929 when we really had the, the, the peak of the, of, 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 of the market and then the market started to correct. Um, October 1929, which was 90 years ago and 30 days ago. Today is the 21st of November. Th the major days of October, and we're now since the, uh, since the Great Crash of 1929, we're always concerned about uh, autumn, in particular October, right? So many crises, we say, start in October for some kind of reason, okay? But what were the major days back then? Okay, so we had Black Thursday, which was 24th of October 1929, which funnily enough is also, was also the 24th of October, Thursday of 2019. What a coincidence, the same day of the week with the same date just 90 years later. That was when, this, when, the, when the, st the market started to correct. There were signs already of the market correcting and coming off in September, but really started in 1929 on the 24th of, of October. Nobody really knows why. Some people say because in, in the UK there was a collapse of enterprises by a gentleman called Charles Hattery. Charles Hattery was an, uh, uh, built, an, uh, 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 built an empire of, of companies and financed it with a lot of debt and he, it collapsed. Some people say this was the reason. Okay? Others say there were some reasons in the US that some companies, some uh, utility companies got into trouble and so on. But nobody really knows exactly why it is, but suddenly this mood changed from a very positive uh, mood of speculation to suddenly people wanting to sell. 1924, uh, 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 24th of, of, of October, uh, uh, people were very concerned the bankers got together in the office of J.P. Morgan, started to get in, then in the afternoon on Friday started buying shares, uh, showing that, ah, oh, we buy the shares of these <coughs> big companies and so on. But it reached investors too late because there was so much trading going on that these tickers that people would read and see this information didn't reach them. They started, <coughs> continued selling. Then people got margin calls because when you <coughs> buy on margin, you have to come up when, when the stock market goes down. You have to go either come up with more money or you have to sell your positions and so on. So 24, uh, there was Thursday, Friday. Uh, back then, people traded on Saturday morning. There was a little bit of uh, uh, activity going on on uh, Saturday morning. And then on Monday morning, Black Monday and Black Tuesday, the selling continued. It was very heavy. In some blues... Uh, blue, uh, blue chip stocks actually sold off by 20, 30, 40 percent. And so like free fall, a little bit like what we saw in 20, 2008, 2009. Um, and this selling then continued all the way to 1933. In the end, the stock market co corrected by almost 90 percent. The stock market, not the individual stock. Some of these investment trusts, like Goldman Sachs Trading Corporation, which was one of the leading investment trusts, trade as high as 
$300 and was worth 65 cents in 1933. There was Goldman Sachs, where Goldman Sachs partners were involved in so on. Um, so people lost the fortune. Um, so between 1930, or let's say 1929, autumn of 1929, and 1933, when FDR, uh, Roosevelt, the new president, took <laughs> office, nothing happened. Because Hoover, the president between 1929 and 1933, uh, adopted who believed in a laissez-faire, not getting involved policy. Okay, that meant the Fed would not do anything, um, the politician would not get involved because it would sort itself out. And it didn't sort itself out, it got worse and worse. Keyword Hoover, uh, uh, the Hoover towns. People losing everything and then having to live somewhere in a shed in Central Parks, in Central Park in New York, okay. Um, so th th so the, 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 the crash on Wall Street led to, uh, to, to, imp to the population losing all their fortunes, people getting extremely poor, uh, uh, losing their, 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 their residences and so forth and so on. So affected then the stock, the affected then the e economy and led to this great depression. Only in 1933 when Hoover got elected and he started a new economic policy called the New Deal with regulation, regulation of the stock market, regulation of, the, uh, of trading, regulations of IPOs and so on. It, there, a slow recovery started, which lasted in a few years. Um, uh, but, but it was, a, it was a, a, a very prolonged depression that we call today the Great Depression. Uh, uh, and really lasted until 1938. In 1938, the Second World War started, which kind of got us uh, refocused. U.S. obviously only entered the uh, Second World War in 1941 uh, with Pearl Harbor, but already we saw some kind of improvement back there. This is a chart that I want to show you here, which shows us here the S&P 500, or the predecessor of the S&P 500, because the S&P 500 didn't exist back then. It was the S&P 50 and an S&P 90, um, where you can see that you have the uh, stock market that actually, uh, because I only, unfortunately, it only goes back to 1928. So 28 to 29 is huge increase, okay? But it would, if you go back to 1920, it would be much much longer, but there's no data available on that. And then you see the shaded periods here are these um, periods of recession. Okay, you saw the long recession, a recession of four years going on. Can you imagine four years of recession? Unbelievable. So it led to uh, a, very, uh, a lot of hardship in the United States of America. Then the recovery and then another recession here in 37, 38, and then came the Second World War. But the point here is that it took the stock market 25 years, from 1929 to 1954, to reach the levels of the S&P 500, was it whatever, what you have you, to get back there. Okay, by comparison, in 2008, 2009, the recovery was much, much quicker. Why? Because mm, Alex hopefully is going to speak, and I know he's going to speak about it, because uh, the, the, the approach was different in Professor Karimi as well. So, so there was a very different understanding, because I think the central bankers, they learned that they, they ignored the, the warnings and they should have done more about that. Okay, so here, just quickly here, a comparison of the sources and theories of the Great Crash. The SETI Commission report, very important document, okay? It's almost like, like a pure document because there's all these interviews with the views and the Picaro Commission. Picaro was a, uh, a, a, a Italo-American who was very uh, uh, anti-bankers. The bankers were very powerful in there in before the great crash and so on. He, as a prosecutor, was very aggressive towards the banks and so on. You see all of that, Fernand Vicari is. So commission report blames the banks and its officers as well as the Federal Reserve for the great crash. See, these were the spectators. That's what the commission report says. Also very interesting, by the way, to look at the commission report of 2010 of the global financial crisis, which I also did, by the way, in my PhD and so on, to see what, what happened over there. And very similar, there are similar 
conclusions there. Then we had Galbraith, who said the crash of 1929 was a consequence of wide speculation, massive leverage, and criminal offensive. Friedman says, okay, it's the, the crash was the result of inadequate monetary policy. Of course, because he's a monetarist. He looks, everything you, you see, so looks through, is through the eyes of money and the monetary policy, okay? Uh, 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 Friedman and, and Schwartz, Anna Schwartz, uh, uh, blame mainly the Fed for the inaction and the underdeveloped tools. I think it's too simplified view. It's not just the Fed. I think it's everybody, the president and so on. And, so on. and then Berman uh, of, uh, of 1920, 1998 in an analysis says it is too simplified to say that. And I like his analysis a lot because he says it's a much more, you have to look at it much more holistically. And you have to say here, there was the illusions of new economic era. You know, it's a new paradigm. We hear it again and again. Now it's different. Okay, so we no longer need to look at valuations and stuff. It can only go up and so on. Um, um, and so that's what he says. So a combination with some mistakes and speculation. Okay. So in conclusion, okay. so in conclusion, the 1920s, as I said, was a decade of economic prosperity and development, interrupted by interrupted by three short recessions. The rally started in 24, lasted for five years, and ended in 29 in tears, okay? And the tears lasted f a very long period of time. It's very different to 2008, 2009, when we had tears, but the tears lasted only from September uh, 2008 until March 2009, and then the markets came back because the central banks came in and stuff, and so, okay? So it lasted for a long, very powerful, very shocking, okay? There's still a disagreement about the causes and reasons, and some but. In my view, okay, it was definitely due to leverage, okay? Leverage can be good and leverage can be bad, bad, okay? As an investor, I don't like leverage. As a trader, I like leverage. Because as a trader, I like magnified uh, uh, returns, okay? But you have to be very careful. You have to be a good risk manager, okay? The same in other markets, not just in the stock markets, in property, it's the same. How much leverage do you use? Depends on how you do it, whether you are a, a trader or whether you are a long-term investor, and so on. Multiple uses of leverage made the market vulnerable, because it wasn't just leverage, it was everybody levered, okay? Um, then we had sophisticated new instruments and players. I mentioned this Florida, the binders in Florida and the, in, the, in the property markets, investment trusts, the holding companies, and so on. The banks and investment banks were engaged both in liquidity taking and liquidity providing. One, I'm not talking about, I didn't talk about this today, but there is this idea of, uh, as, in, as a market participant, I'm either a liquidity taker or liquidity provider. If I'm an investor, I'm a liquidity taker. I just want to buy and sell. A liquidity provider is a broker or a bank which gives you, provides liquidity, either by lending money or by buying and selling all the time, okay? Uh, but what happened in 1929 is the liquidity providers pulled out of the market, okay? They were no longer there, okay? So there was no liquidity. There was no way to borrow money, and there was no way to trade because suddenly the spreads widened a lot, okay? Uh, and the Fed as a land of last resort was late in liquidity provision, okay? What's important is it started as a the crash was a U.S. phenomenon, okay? But then it spread into the economy and spread on a global basis. And Europe suffered for other reasons, mainly political instability, and post-war effects. And if you think about that, and then I perhaps actually describe the, 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 uh, the, the connection to today, okay? In 1933, Hitler came to power, even though he had lost the elections. He had less votes than in 1932, okay? But people lifted him, helped him to get into the position of becoming the Chancellor of the Reich, okay? Hopefully something like this is not going to happen again. In this country and other countries where actually people who actually are not supposed to become leaders potentially might get elected because the circumstances are such that you get in. Okay? So with this, uh, I conclude my, my observations about 1929. And now I call on Professor Karimi from the University of Graz to talk about the crisis and in particular the legal aspects of that. Thank you very much.
Yeah, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and representatives of finance and academia, it's a great pleasure for me to speak here in this uh, distinguished uh, forum about a very important topic, uh, namely the great crash of 1929 called Black Friday. We have heard a lot of things about this, um, which ushered in Great uh, Depression. Here you can see a um, picture of people gathering in New York, uh, October 24th, across the street from the New York Stock Exchange. Thousands of investors lost their savings in the worst uh, stock market crash in Wall Street history. And what followed was the Great Depression. We have heard a lot um, already. So the unemployment rate um, rose um, even to uh, 24%. And um, what were uh, the reasons? We have heard already lots of them. Uh, I will uh, look um, through them uh, again a little bit in order to uh, substitute my uh, theories. Then I will uh, jump to the present challenges and alarms and uh, will give you an outlook um, for the future according to my researches. As you know, I'm a professor in public international law and uh, therefore my focus will be on the legal matters of that kind. Um, yeah, historical uh, overview. The stock market crash of uh, 1929 um, ended the um, economic uh, boom of uh, the golden 20s um, abruptly in the last uh, century. The downturn uh, following uh, the financial quake entered the history books as a great depression um, and is still considered as uh, the heaviest and longest world economic uh, crisis of the modern era. In the documentary, um, The Crash of 1929, the US author uh, John Steele Gordon uh, said, um, the uh, economists uh, at that time said, we had reached a new level of prosperity in this country that would never fall behind again. And then the crash came. On Thursday, of the penultimate week of October, panic set in. At the opening of the trade, the market fell by 11%. It managed to stabilize uh, the courses for a short uh, time, but on Monday uh, 21st and uh, Tuesday 22nd of October 1929, the market was down another more than 20% uh, and on uh, 24th uh, October, um, Black Thursday, um, it was um, the uh, worst uh, day. While um, US economy plunged into a deep crisis, uh, assets of companies and households uh, were destroyed. Um, the Dow by mid-1932 uh, was under 90% below its uh, previous record high and the Dow, <coughs> we heard already very much about it, did not re recover until, his, uh, um, until 1954. Um, so um, what were the reasons for this uh, decline? How could such an extreme decline be possible? According to numerous uh, researchers, um, there were several reasons. We have already uh, heard about it um, very much. Um, just to summarize them a little bit, um, one important reason was mainly uh, the kind of gambling. Um, it was, uh, was very uh, common at that time to gamble on the stock market uh, when buying shares, often uh, only a fraction um, had to be paid. The result was a huge uh, speculative uh, bubble. Then another important reason for the loss of the Dow uh, was an inexperienced central bank. The US Federal uh, Reserve is seen by experts, um, historians, as a decisive uh, factor, not the only factor, but a decisive factor. 
the Fed was founded only in 1913. Uh, it was relatively inexperienced uh, at that time and made an unfortunate um, figure during the crisis, I would say. In the optimistic boom years uh, of the 1920s, the central bankers left monetary policy to lose, according to many researchers, and um, uh, yeah, and for a long time did little to curb the sometimes irrational uh, exurbances in the market. When the bubble burst, uh, the Fed then let many bankrupt banks die, rather than flood the financial uh, fin system with extra <laughs> liquidity. In retrospect, um, this brought a lot of criticism to the institution, to the Fed, including that of uh, later Federal Reserve uh, Chairman Ben Barnang. Well, another reason, uh, we have also heard much about it, um, the, uh, it were the many international conflicts that burdened uh, the global um, economy. It was um, after the First uh, World War um, and the Treaty of uh, Versailles with its controversial uh, J uh, German reparation payments. There were many other international uh, conflicts that burdened uh, the global economy. Uh, the US uh, too um, uh, brought it with it that uh, economy uh, began to cool down. And one important um, issue was uh, uh, the US government's decision to increase tariff uh, barriers. So uh, according to legal analysts, um, there was one law, namely the so-called uh, Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of uh, June 17, 1930. Um, it is also seen by historians um, as the law uh, that brought the final uh, great uh, depression. But of course there is mu much uh, um, discussion about it um, and it's certainly not only one measure that um, yeah, brought the um, great uh, depression. So now I turn to um, the present challenges and alarms. Um, according to my point of view and my researches, researchers, there are at least some alarms and parallels for an extreme scenario in 1929. So what are these alarms? In the US, a um, whole series of lossy startups uh, were already listed on the stock markets um, with billions of dollars um, in this year. Alarm signals uh, were already sent by the bond market. Um, there, the government bonds with short uh, maturities yielded more returns in the meantime than long ones, and um, many um, important um, uh, analysts say this is an indicator of uh, res uh, recession. Even on the stock markets, prices have uh, again reached a level after years of a rally fueled um, by cheap central uh, bank money, which is sometimes uh, decoupled from the real economic um, situation. But, um, and uh, that is uh, my focus in my recent researches, hopefully I will um, have enough time in the future to write uh, a book about it. Um, Damage is caused um, also by the many trade wars that take place nowadays. Well, um, US President Donald Trump tweeted in March 2018, trade wars are good and easy to win. Trump has um, recently uh, been uh, content with a partial um, settlement in the conflict with China uh, that can hardly be considered a sign of uh, strength, according to my um, point of view. Instead, the clinch of the world's two largest economic powers is now traded um, the most threatening uh, global economic risk. Well, uh, what are these trade wars? I could uh, go uh, into detail um, into many of these trade wars, but I will focus 
in my speech on one um, very important or maybe the most important uh, trade war involving Europe, including the U UK, that is the um, uh, WTO case, European Communities and Certain Member States Measures Affecting Trade in Large Civil Aircraft. Um, that is the so-called uh, Airbus uh, trade war. And um, maybe after my analysis, you will understand why this is really, really a big uh, topic um, in Europe, at least, and for the UK, of course, as well. Well, in this uh, dispute, the US claimed that the European communities and uh, certain of its member states, four member states, France, Germany, Spain, and the United Kingdom, had caused through the use of specific subsidies adverse effects uh, to the United States interests in form of serious prejudice under Article 5C and uh, Article 6 uh, 3 of the agreement on subsidies and counter Veiling measures, um, the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, SCM, I will uh, say in the future of my speech, uh, addresses two separate uh, but closely related topics, multilateral disciplines regulating the provision of subsidies and the use of countervailing measures to offset injury caused by subsidized um, imports. While Article 5, um, uh, C speaks um, about uh, adverse um, effects and um, C serious prejudi uh, prejudice to the interests of another member. That is what um, United States claimed. The other article is Article 6.3, serious pre prejudice in the sense of paragraph C of Article 5, uh, which I quoted before, may arise in any case where one or several of the following uh, apply the effect of the subsidy is to display or impede the imports of a like product of an, uh, another member in the market uh, of the subsidizing manner. The effort of subsidy uh, is to display or impede the exports of a like product and see the effect of a subsidy is a significant price undercutting by the subsidized uh, product as compared with the price of a like product of another member. Well, um, the, um, each of those uh, measures related to the design and uh, development <coughs> by Airbus um, of large civil aircrafts. That is the point. It uh, only concerns large civil aircrafts. Um, there is a definition of this kind of uh, aircraft. Large uh, civil aircrafts are tube and wing aircraft with uh, turbofan engines carried under low set wings designed for subsonic flight. Uh, LCA, uh, large civil aircraft, are designed for transporting 100 or more passengers and or proportionate um, amount of cargo. And, um, well, uh, LCA are covered by tariff uh, classification heading uh, 8802.40 uh, of the harmonized um, system. So this is um, the, um, the case uh, behind. It is uh, about these large civil aircrafts. It's not about military <laughs> aircrafts. It's not about other aircrafts. It's only about large civil aircrafts, but nowadays civil um, aircraft uh, industry is growing more and more, so you can understand why this is a very sensitive uh, issue. Well, um, there was um, an original uh, panel uh, after the United States uh, claimed to be um, threatened in their interests and um, the measures of uh, uh, European Union and the four member states caused uh, um, injuries. Um, there was a um, panel, a dispute settlement panel um, established at, at the uh, <coughs> WTO, the World uh, Trade Organization. The dispute settlement uh, uh, body that has the authority to establish 
dispute settlement panels refers matters to arbitration, adopt uh, panel reports, maintain surveillance of um, um, implementation of recommendations and rulings and authorize also um, suspension of um, cessation in the extent of com non-compliance with uh, those recommendations ruling. So you see the dispute settlement body, a powerful uh, body within the uh, WTO. And um, it uh, was an original panel established on uh, 20 July uh, 2005. It found that uh, following specific uh, subsidies related to the production and development of LCA, um, large civil aircrafts, were inconsistent with Articles 5C and 63A, B and C of the uh, SCM agreement. First, there were launch aid or member state um, financing, um, the short uh, uh, version is LAMSF uh, for many, many types of Airbus. French and government uh, equity infusions provided in connections with the corporate uh, restructuring of French and um, German aerospace manufacturers, um, Aerospecial uh, from uh, Spain and Deutsche Airbus uh, from uh, Germany. And third, certain infrastructure and infrastructure-related measures provided by German and Spanish authorities to Airbus in the form uh, of, for example, uh, regional development grants. And uh, the fourth um, was uh, certain research and uh, technological development funding provided to Airbus for LCA-related uh, research and technological development project in which Airbus participated. So there were uh, a, a few, uh, many um, uh, things um, uh, involved here. In addition, the original panel uh, found that the United States uh, had established that the German, Spanish <coughs> and uh, United Kingdom uh, LAMSF uh, um, launch aid uh, member state um, uh, uh, financial, uh, financial um, for the Airbus uh, Type 380 constituted even prohibited uh, export subsidies within the meaning of uh, Article 3.1a and footnote 4 uh, um, of the SCM agreement. You can all read this in this huge panel report. Um, yeah. There was then later on an appeal. Um, the um, appeal in the uh, appeal, the appellate body reversed the original panel's finding that the German, um, uh, Spanish, and UK aid uh, 380 LA. Uh, MSF uh, contracts uh, constituted prohibited uh, export subsidies under uh, the quoted article uh, 3.1. Um, however, it was unable, the appellate body was unable to complete the legal analysis with regard to article 3.1a due to insufficient factual findings or in disputed, um, undisputed fact on the panel record. Well, uh, the appellate body also reversed or modified several other aspects of the original uh, panel findings and completed the legal analysis where it had sufficient factual findings or undisputed facts on the record to do so. Um, yeah, um, with regard to the issues of uh, subsidization and adverse effects, um, the appellate body completed the legal analyse, analysis and ultimately concluded that the use of the challenged LA um, MSF measures, uh, launch aid and uh, member state um, uh, finance uh, measures, had caused adverse effects to the U.S. interests and second, the equity infusions 
and infrastructure measure measures um, that were found by the original panel to constitute specific subsidies complemented even and uh, supplemented the effects of <coughs> the LA MSF measures. So it's a quite hot uh, report. Um, many people were shocked when uh, they read all this. But it was not unexpected, of course. It was a case that, uh, uh, last, uh, that lasted uh, 14 years. Um, the appellate body um, upheld the original body recommendation um, pursuant to Article 7.8 of the uh, SCM agreement and recommended that the dispute settlement body request the U European Union to bring its measures um, that were found to be inconsistent uh, with the uh, CSM <coughs> agreement into conformity with the obligations under that um, agreement. So what um, says uh, Article 7.8? Uh, uh, Article 7.8, where a panel report or an <coughs> appellate body report is adopted, in which it is determined that any subsidy has resulted in adverse effects to the interests of um, another member state uh, within the meaning of Article 5, uh, which I quoted uh, previously, the member granting or maintaining such subsidy shall take appropriate steps to remove the adverse effects or shall withdraw the subsidy. Um, well, on um, June uh, 1st, um, 2011, the dispute settlement body adopted uh, the uh, appellate uh, body report um, and uh, the original panel report as modified by the uh, appellate body report and um, in December, 1st uh, December 2011, the European Union afterwards informed the dispute settlement body in a compliance communication that it had taken all the appropriate steps to bring its measures into conformity with its World Trade Organization obligations, thereby ensuring full implementation of the um, W uh, of the dispute settlement uh, body's recommendations and rulings, which I uh, explained already um, before. Well, um, only a few days later, namely on 9 December uh, 2011, the US requested to hold consultations at the uh, WTO with the European Union and the four member states, um, alleging that the European Union had failed to comply with the recommendations and rulings of the dispute settlement body. Later on in March uh, 2012, uh, the US requested for the establishment of another panel pursuant to Article 21.5 of the Dispute Settlement Understanding. I will now not go too much into detail um, of these uh, legal questions with the standard terms of reference. And this panel was um, or also established later on uh, in April um, 2012. So before this panel, the United States um, had uh, argued that the relevant subsidies found to have caused adver adverse effects in the original proceedings continue to uh, cause adverse effects and that by agreeing to um, provide Airbus will with LAMSF for the uh, Airbus 350 family of aircraft, the four member states uh, have continued and even expanded the subsidization of Airbus LSA activities, thereby causing additional adverse uh, effects within the meaning of the already uh, quoted Article 5 and 6 of the SCM. Uh, agreement. Well, on this basis, uh, the US um, also submitted um, that the European Union and uh, the four member states um, failed to take 
appropriate steps to remove all these adverse effects um, or withdraw uh, the subsidy <coughs> within the meaning of the quoted Article 7. And um, the US also claimed that um, Airbus 350 family and 380 um, uh, 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 family measures are prohibited export and or even imports substitution subsidies within even another uh, article of the SCM agreement. This uh, report um, of the panel which was, um, which was published uh, in September 2016 wa was then later circulated um, to the uh, members of the WTO and having found that the challenged uh, subsidies have caused present uh, serious prejudice to the US interests within the meaning of the uh, quoted Article 5. Um, the panel made no findings, however, with respect to the US conditional uh, claim that the challenged subsidies uh, threatened to cause serious prejudice um, to its interests. Well, what happened next? Um, the, uh, on October 2016, <coughs> the European Union notified the dispute settlement body pursuant uh, to Article 16.4 of the dispute settlement understanding of its intention to appeal certain issues of law covered in the panel report and certain legal interpretations developed by the panel and filed a notice of appeal pursuant to <coughs> Rule 20 of the working procedures uh, uh, too specific now. Later on, um, also um, on 13 October, uh, the chair of the appellate body received a joint letter from uh, all participants in this uh, case, namely the U European Union um, and the US requesting the division hearing this appeal to adopt uh, additional procedures to protect business confidential uh, information and highly sensitive business um, information in these appellate uh, proceedings. According about this, uh, um, at least uh, about these issues, um, there was consensus. <coughs> well, uh, what happened next? On uh, 10 uh, November 2016, the uh, United States notified the dispute settlement body of its intention to appeal certain issues of law covered in the previous panel report and certain legal uh, interpretations developed by the panel. And in December 2016, the appellate uh, body received a letter from the European Union referring to this ongoing appeal and to the then anticipated appeals in US large aircraft. There is a similar, ca similar case against Boeing uh, going on. So really Airbus, Boeing, they are really fighting each other. Um, there are many discussions um, in that context why Boeing uh, uh, 747, uh, uh, this new type of uh, Boeing um, has uh, some uh, difficulties. Uh, yeah. Well, um, on 15 May 2018, and uh, that is uh, what brings me quite to the current uh, situation, the World Trade Organization ruled um, in this already 14-year-old uh, dispute that the subsidy of 22 billion uh, US dollars for the Airbus Group justified by the European Union um, as start-up um, financing launch aid uh, member state uh, financing constituted an undue distortion of competition. Well, Boeing uh, CEO um, Dennis uh, Mollenberg welcomed, of course, uh, the verdict um, as a clear message that disregard of rules, of international rules and illegal subsidies will not be tolerated. The US representatives, uh, Robert um, Leitzer, warned uh, the European Union that um, if it does not 
uh, stop breaking the rules and offend uh, US interests, the, then EU products will be retaliated by the uh, WTO uh, after such um, arbitration awards. Well, um, what happened um, then? It was um, in October 2019, it was announced that the WTO uh, allows really these US punitive uh, tariffs on EU imports. Uh, WTO arbitrators approved retaliatory uh, measures for 7. Point, uh, billion uh, US uh, dollar worth of imports, um, currently around uh, 6.9 billion uh, euro um, a year. And uh, this was said um, by, uh, by the um, WTO recently in um, Geneva. This is the highest amount um, that was ever approved in the 20 year uh, old history of the WTO. An appeal against uh, the, this arbitration award is excluded. The US is planning new uh, levies, new um, taxes on aircraft and uh, components of the aviation industry as well as <coughs> on many other products uh, such as cheese, olive uh, oil, oranges and flour and so on. The punitive uh, tariffs may be imposed until uh, the defeated party, which is the European Union, and of course these uh, four um, powerful member states, um, has eliminated the alleged trade distortions. <coughs> um, Brussels, the European Union, however, says this was done long before. Uh, well, there is nothing to do anymore uh, from our side. And um, this about this application, about uh, this um, um, uh, application, will there will be an examination, but there is still no date when it will take place. So, um, according to the uh, figures from the statistics of Eurostat, uh, goods worth uh, 406 billion euros were exported to the US in 2018. Uh, the other way uh, around, it was worth 267 billion euro, euros. Um, the state that would be hit hardest in this uh, uh, war, in this trade war, uh, within the European Union would be Germany, according to a German uh, institute, the Kiel Institute, for the world economy, it has to expect export losses of up to 2 billion euros um, annually. Of course, the EU is not uh, standing uh, idly. The European Union warned already the US before the introduction of new uh, tariffs, um, even if the WTO uh, has approved these uh, planned US measures, recourse to them would be short-sighted and counterproduct. Um, this was recently said by uh, European Union Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström. The European Union, this is the last uh, information that I have on this uh, case, wants to impose billions of retaliatory uh, tariffs on the US including aircraft components as well as uh, on other um, uh, 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 stuff like uh, tomato, tomato ketchup and so on. Well, um, recently Carl Icahn, um, a famous uh, um, analyst and uh, a really rich man, he understands, uh, I would say, much about this topic, he said on Monday 15, 2018, tariffs are a dangerous game and have caused stock market crashes. With tariffs, um, it's a very dangerous game you're playing. Billionaire investor uh, said it helped bring the crash in 1929. I'm not a great supporter of it and um, he um, thinks President Donald Trump <coughs> finally will be wise enough uh, to consider 
um, that all this will be settled. Well, um, the question now is, um, could uh, a crash 2099 and uh, the following uh, depression um, happen again? Um, as we heard already, there are few people alive um, anymore who remember living through the stock market uh, crash of uh, 1929, but plenty of people, um, they still view that um, the fateful plunge as a worst case scenario for that might, um, what might uh, fall um, investors, the roughly 20% uh, decline for the large stocks um, in October 1929 um, actually wasn't the market's worst month um, ever, but the drop uh, incited nearly three years of relentless selling and helped to usher in the Great um, Depression. Could a 29, uh, 1929 style uh, market setback happen again, my question? Uh, my answer is yes and no. Yes, why yes? The 57% uh, uh, plunge from October uh, 9th, uh, 2007, um, to March uh, 2009 uh, was a stark reminder on that, um, that severe stock market losses are still possible, um, though that uh, down um, draft wasn't uh, um, <laughs> pronounced as the 83% uh, uh, tumble from October 1999 um, to June 1932. Future, future declines could even be worse, according to my um, um, analysis, and I'm not just dealing with uh, public international economic law, but also public international environmental law, so there is a huge environmental um, yeah, uh, factor also in it. Future declines could be even worse if triggered by um, a war, deep depression, health crisis, major political upheaval, natural disasters, um, or other uh, trauma. And why it could not happen, um, a, a 1929 type crash, um, because of uh, several uh, factors and uh, several safeguards. Um, First of all, of course, the world has changed in those nine uh, decades, um, often for the better. Uh, people now have a much better understanding of how investing and the economy um, work um, and many important protections and safety uh, nets are now in place. There are also more um, stock markets have, that have emerged and expanded across uh, the globe and many new industries have um, proliferated providing not just uh, more opportunities but also a greater caution against the collapse uh, through diversification or spreading um, among many baskets. Well, um, why could it not happen um, as it was in 1929 and the uh, years afterwards? There are also more government regulations in place today which uh, provide uh, protections. Many of these government uh, regulations were implemented uh, in the wake of the uh, market crash and the uh, Great uh, Depression. For instance, uh, investor oversight agencies like Securities and Exchange Commission didn't exist uh, uh, during um, the 1920s, for instance, or uh, there was no government uh, oversight of the banking uh, system um, as it uh, exists uh, today. Bank failures um, proliferated as the depression deepened in 1929 and uh, uh, years afterwards and many people lost their life savings. Um, bank panics were uh, more um, impactful than stock market um, 
uh, crashes and uh, banks um, engaged more heavily in speculation, but all this is now much more under control. There are also many other regulations um, which now protect investors uh, strong, stronger and which uh, uh, protect also consumers uh, generally. Uh, they include laws that uh, cleaned up uh, the mutual fund uh, industry and now protect investors when uh, brokerages fail. There is also more availability of uh, good quality uh, information, um, which has made the markets more efficient, I would say, but, but maybe we will hear something else um, in the next speech, um, and put them on a more even playing field. People understand um, trading much more, um, investing knowledge has improved, um, and also uh, investors remain uh, more careful. Um, they don't risk uh, anymore, um, but uh, they spread their assets around in real estate, bonds, uh, bank accounts, commodities, uh, collectibles, um, and more. Um, today, only a half um, of Americans have stock market um, investments and many of uh, the invest uh, many of those invest through mutual funds or other portfolios uh, where a professional um, is calling um, the shots well this is um, my analysis to the um, crash of 1929 and if uh, there are um, enough reasons why it could happen today again. Thank you for your attention. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Jacob, for having me. Um, I'm from Ruffa. Um, we've had an extraordinarily detailed and comprehensive overview of 29, its pathologies before and after. So we're going to do a whistle-stop tour through a couple of the things I think worth drawing out of that. And then we're going to look at how we can learn some lessons from it and how the world looks today. Um, we're going to start with these two random fish swimming along. They happen to meet an older fish heading in the opposite direction. And the older fish says, morning boys, how's the water? And uh, the two young fish swim on for a bit quizzically and then one turns to the other and says, what the hell is water? Now the point of this somewhat cheesy vignette is that the most important things about our everyday lives, uh, the architecture of the world we live in, tend to be the things that we stop noticing. But it's that very architecture changing that can result in something like the 1929 Great Crash. Lessons learned. Ben Bernanke, a student of the Great Depression himself. We're going to see a lot of that in a moment. If you want to understand geology, study earthquakes. If you want to understand economics, study the Depression. And that's what we're doing in this presentation here. Now, we've heard quite a lot about the damage the Depression did to the American economy in particular and the stock market. It was broader than that. Of course, you had big industrial declines in Germany and France, United Kingdom. And you can see here 50% loss in industrial production in the United States during the Great Depression. Compare it to the Great Financial Crisis. So we've got to ask the question, why was it that it was so much worse then? And in 2008, we got off much more lightly. Deflation was a huge problem. The price level fell 25%. That's a real problem if it's a debt crisis and you found yourself in the proverbial muck because you got too much debt, your margins being called. Deflation makes that debt more expensive to pay back and you very quickly get into a deflation death spiral. So that was a huge problem in 29. As a result, a lot of banks went to the wall. Now the numbers you see when people talk about the depression tend to differ because they'll usually be talking about different dates. Sometimes people talk about stuff to 1933 when the stock market bottomed. Sometimes it's the start of World War II. This is basically the whole of the 30s. 50% of US banks fail. That's extraordinary. What's even more extraordinary is in the great financial crisis, the biggest of our lifetimes, less than 1% failed. Again, why was that? Superficially, lots of similarities, but some fundamental differences too. Now, we heard that in nominal terms, so basic index numbers, it took until 1954 to get back to the previous index high after the 29 crash.
But that's not the whole story because people don't think about inflation enough. Yes, we had big deflationary problems, but actually it took you nearly 30 years to get your money back if you'd bought near the peak. It took you 30 years to get your money back in real terms. Now, put that in context, the last two big smash-ups we had in dot-com and after 2008 in particular, much quicker. And indeed, over the last 30 years, pretty much everything has gone up. So the water in which we've all been swimming is one where people assume that asset class is pretty much whatever you own, stocks, bond, fine wine, art, cars, you name it, everything goes up in real terms. It's not true. It doesn't happen. And you can lose your money for a generation. So in the Great Depression, Bernanke continues, the Federal Reserve, despite its mandate, was quite passive. And as a result, the financial crisis became very severe. And that informed Bernanke's extremely aggressive action in the aftermath of 2008. So we've heard a little bit about the gold standard earlier from Jacob and how important that was as a transmission mechanism for exporting deflation and economic carnage around the rest of the world. And pretty much, without exception, you can work out how badly affected a country's economy was during the Great Depression, depending on how quickly they came off the gold standard. America lingered on the gold standard longer than others, and it suffered more as a result. And here's the money supply. Basically, when that's contracting, it's a huge headwind to the economy. Between 29 and 32, significant reduction in the United States versus 2008, 2009, when the central bank is pumping huge amounts of money into the system through various channels, helping to reflate the economy and stop us facing another Great Depression. But it wasn't only monetary policy. In the first years of the Depression, we heard from our distinguished speakers earlier that the government was resistant to spending too much. They didn't want to open the fiscal spigots. And of course, you've got all the complex dynamics of Hoover's administration there as well. But the first two years of 2008, we saw huge expansion in the deficit. The government opened the taps. Congress put hundreds of billions of fiscal stimulus in at the same time as interest rates were cut to the floor and quantitative easing got off the floor. So when orthodoxy fails, you need to try new things. Roosevelt, president from the 32 election, starting 33, very willing to try unorthodox approaches. Now, we've already said that characterized Bernanke's approach. But there were three R's of FDR's time in office. He's the, the great New Deal. That was his scheme. We hear about the Green New Deal. Well, the original New Deal is an FDR, as in fact is the first 100 days. Every time you hear about the first 100 days of a president, they're referring back to FDR. Relief for the unemployed, recovery for the economy, fiscal stimulus, reform of financial system to prevent repeat, tighter regulations, the SEC looking over every trade. So we see a fiscal response, we see a regulatory response, we see benefits. What does that look like compared to our experience in recent history? On the left-hand side, the per capita cost in 2009 crisis dollars of the stimulus that FDR dumped on the US economy several years into a dire contraction, much bigger than 2008, even though in totality, of course, the Recovery Act in the Obama era was bigger. Of course, the population had changed a lot in that period. What else is going on? I talked about the fiscal response. Remarkably, despite the fact that the US economy was in free fall, debt to GDP hardly budged in the early 30s in the United States, and that's because they refused to open the fiscal spigots. No such problem in 2008, 2009. But I hear you say, Alex, there's an obvious problem with that. And I say, yes, you're right. The obvious problem is that you take out more debt, you've got to pay it back at some point in the future. So they've solved a short-term problem. They've avoided a Great Depression. But now we've got mounting debt that's got to be dealt with down the line. For a side-by-side -side to understand how different the economic outcomes on the back of these different policy responses actually were, we've got a few examples here. Exports in the United States, first three years down 60%. They fell a lot more than that. Subsequently, world trade in totality fell two-thirds to 1933. Global GDP, not just the US, Great Britain, France, and Russia, down 15% in the three years afterwards. These are huge numbers. 
So what are the similarities we've seen? They're both banking crises, and Jacob eloquently explained the transmission mechanism through leverage, through the bank's activities, through speculation, through margin trading. Uh, the collapse in international trade, well, we saw that after 2008, but much less um, extremely, but of course, in a globalised financial and trading system, that's unavoidable to some extent. Currency manipulation, ultimately achieved in the 1930s by coming off the gold standard that allowed countries to devalue and control their own interest rates more. But in 2008, 2009, they did it by immediately cutting interest rates and pumping loads of money into the economy. All else being equal, if you put $21 trillion of paper money into your economy, your exchange rate's going to go down. That's the sum for all developed world banks having done QE. But if you dump extra money into your economy and the goods and services stay the same, all else being equal, the value of your currency is going to decline versus other people's. There's political reform. In the aftermath of the Great Crash, we had Glass-Steagall separating commercial banking and investment banking operations. In the aftermath of 2008, we've had Dodd-Frank. Similarities there. Differences. Well, we've seen very clearly there was a totally different policy response. They didn't turn on the fiscal spigots at the start of the Great Depression. They didn't cut interest rates to the floor. They allowed the money supply to shrink. There was no QE. <coughs> Exacerbated the problem. And that led to massive bank failures. And the really critical moment, as Jacob touched on earlier, was the banking crisis that followed the crash. The fact that all the banks went to the wall, the money supply collapsed, a deflationary spiral ensued. Unemployment, as we saw from the slide two back, yes, it went up in 2008, 2009, but only to about 10%. In the Depression, as Yvonne talked about earlier, we saw it going up to 25%. And it's worse than that because of those that still had jobs, lots of them went on to part-time contracts. So 50% of the United States' labour force productive capacity was underutilised or not utilised at all in the 1930s. Market losses. Big market losses in both cases, but more recently, a much faster bounce back on the back of stimulus. And remember that in 29, it wasn't just the initial crash, it was the further declines in the early 30s that carried you out, and you didn't get your money back in real terms, remember that, for 29 years. So that brings us to the present. We've done a compare and contrast to two of the great financial crises. And by the way, to the list of crises that Jacob offered earlier, for those that are interested, I would add the 1914 London financial crisis before the First World War. That is the biggest financial crisis to hit the London market ever. It makes 2008 look like a walk in the park. You want to see big stimulus from the state, look at 1914. So where are we today? This in blue is the US economy, GDP for the last 30 years. In green is the net worth of US households financial assets, real estate, stocks, bonds, pensions, you name it, it's in there. Now, that's a pretty good proxy for financial valuations in the markets. And over the long run, what would you expect? You'd expect that financial assets derive their value from the real world, right? So you plot those lines back to the Second World War, and they track each other very closely. What starts happening in the last 30 years is that we get these credit booms and busts. Interest rates are too low. People take out money. What do they do with the money? Just like the credit expansion in the 20s, it goes into speculation. What do you speculate on? You speculate on assets. Then it pops. You go back down. You cut rates to a new low because you've got to provide additional stimulus. You blow a bigger bubble. And our guess is that we're now in the middle of an everything bubble and that those jaws are going to close at some point in the future. And to explain just how extreme the distortions wrought by the stimulus that was so effective in preventing a Great Depression but potentially so dangerous in terms of the effects down the line actually are, we're looking at corporate credit to GDP in America. So effectively, all you have to understand about this is that the higher the blue line goes, the more debt US companies are carrying versus the size of the economy, and the higher, generally speaking, the risk is to people lending to those companies. Now, the green line shows you the extra income, the extra yield you get as an investor for holding that riskier debt. So Finance 101, you take more risk, you should get what? More return, right? 
So that's what happens historically. The risk goes up on the blue line, the green line goes up as well. What's happened in zero interest rates is complete inversion of the most basic rule of finance. Your risk has rocketed, but your returns have gone down. That is completely extraordinary. And the reason is that when you can't get any income on your cash, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and buy anything that gives you a bit of a return. And through that mechanism, the spillover effect ensures that all financial assets in the system are distorted. Now, this stimulus has had other effects. It's always the case, or almost always the case, that financial assets do better in an economic boom time than the real economy, wages and the like. This time it's been turbocharged because quantitative easing and zero rates are particularly good for the holders of assets already. And that has contributed, amongst other factors, to political instability within the Western world. We could list globalization's hollowing out effects on traditional industries and communities. We could talk about the spillover effects from the debt crisis in 2008. We can talk about mass migration and other concerns, all sorts of things going in here. But as a result, we see the stimulus response feeding through into a set of problems that still have to be dealt with. Internationally, the situation looks much more precarious than it has done for a very long time. I hear you asking, Alex, what on earth is a map of the contiguous land empires of the year 1700 got to do with 1929, 2019 and 2009? The answer is that the benign 30 years I talked about earlier that's encompassed both dot-com and 2008 and the spectacular, rec spectacular recovery since has been <coughs> underwritten by geopolitical peace, unipolarity, American power, Western dominance. This is completely atypical in history, right? And as ancient great civilizations come into their own again, they have different ideas about how things should be done. The world's becoming more unstable. We see a new Cold War between China and America. The table's in flux and it's all to play for. We see tariffs. This is what Yvonne was talking about earlier on. Very important. We've seen a washing machine, the lowly washing machine, 20% more expensive than 18 months ago if you're a US consumer. Trump undermining the independence of the Federal Reserve. Now, this is really important because in 1929, the big problem was the central bank didn't want to do anything. And it was limited anyway because on the gold standards, they had to have 40% gold backing the currency in circulation. So the Fed didn't do much and get a lot of the stick rightly for not doing so. 2008, 2009, the central bank took masses of action. But now interest rates are incredibly low. And it's difficult to get the same level of stimulus if we find ourselves back in the proverbial muck. So we think that there's a big fiscal stimulus coming <coughs> and that because of high levels of debt in the world and because of the low levels of interest rates, it is likely that central banks will be leaned on to square the circle between those competing imperatives, need to spend money and high debt, low interest rates. So Claudio Borio, this is um, a, a head honcho at the Bank of International Settlements. That's like the central banker's central bank. Imagine what the uh, levels of banter are there. <laughs> we heard earlier on about the risk of a Minsky moment. Minsky, stability breeds instability. And this is what Borio is channeling. There are few things more insidious in markets than the illusion of permanent calm. We've had 30 years where even when you've had big crashes, everything's gone up. And people forget that in 29, you had a big crash, then it went down more, and you didn't get your money back in real terms for 30 years. And that's what we see here. 30 years of US stock gains, US bonds. I said earlier you could have fine wine, art, classic cars, UK property. Asset managers have felt like geniuses in this era. It's been almost impossible not to make money. And of course the long-term decline in inflation and interest rates off the back of things like China's re-engagement with the global economy, off the back of the end of the Cold War, of technology and a demographic boom are hugely important. But what tends to happen is that when things have been going in a particular direction for a long period of time, people assume it'll go on forever. Let's think about Irving Fisher just before 1929's crash with the immortal prediction that valuations of stocks had reached a new and permanent high. Egg on face. So here we are today, 2019. These are US stock valuations in green since the 1880s and interest rates in the US in blue. 
The lower the interest rate goes, of course, the higher the bond goes because there's an inverse relationship between price and yield. And what you'll spot is that the cyclically adjusted ratio for the US stocks, which is the jargony way of saying long-term valuation measure, has only ever been higher at the peak of 1929 and the peak of dot-com. And the problem, if you're people that want to preserve capital, is that your traditional offset, government bonds, are also incredibly expensive. You could have bought a 10-year UK government bond benchmark issue before 2008. It pays you 5% income. You've got capital appreciation potential on top as well. Today, it pays less than a fifth of that. So you're getting below inflation income, and there's not much room for capital appreciation either. You've got to feel pretty lucky. And as a result, with rates so low and the kind of stimulus we saw in 2008 more difficult, we think that this big fiscal blitz is coming. It's got to go into the real economy uh, rather than being locked up in the financial system. If you want to know why dumping that $21 trillion of printed money into the economy didn't generate real-world inflation, although it generated a lot of asset price inflation, part of the story is that it got locked up on the balance sheets of the financial system. So money gets poured onto the bank balance sheets. They're repairing them. So they stop lending. And that's very typical after a crash. It happened in 1929. It's one of the reasons we had the disaster of the Great Depression. Banks got very conservative. They stopped lending. That reduced consumption and investment in the rest of the economy. And you get a self-fulfilling circle. So these are some of the things we think that money will be spent on in the next crisis, precisely because we can't have exactly the same kind of response that worked so well in 2008 on the back of the lessons Bernanke observed from 1929. So the big question, of course, is how should you think about protecting yourself in this world that's changing so quickly with high asset price valuations, huge amounts of debt. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that if you've had a big debt crisis, you don't solve it by taking more debt. That's exactly what's happened. You reduce interest rates, what are people going to do? Money's cheap, they're going to take it out, they're going to put it into assets, the credit bubble and the asset bubble are going to go up and eventually it comes back down to earth. So we've got all sorts of different things. We've got options that are like insurance contracts to protect us from market wipeout. We've got gold. We've got index linked bonds. They're inflation protected government securities. We think conventionals will really suffer. Once this fiscal stimulus works, it works its way through, you're going to find inflation ticking up, but rates will have to stay very low. What happened in 1936-37 with another crash in the US market was that people thought interest rates were going back up. They were going back to the pre-great crash monetary and fiscal policy stance, and that panicked the market. So we think they're going to have to keep rates low for a long period of time. That means lots of financial repression. <coughs> so there you have it. We've had 30 extraordinarily benign years. The show's been kept on the road, not least by the lessons learned by Bernanke and co. from 1929. But the problem is a lot of those actions have themselves sown the seeds of the next crisis. And you tend to find that regulators, politicians, and sometimes even investors are fighting the last war. So thank you very much indeed for your time. And I think it's now the panel. <coughs> Ah, Ian and <coughs> ah, yeah, thank you. Now you can destroy everything else. <laughs> <laughs>
what happens is you get a benign world, uh, people get confident, people borrow money, people buy assets, the value of the assets go up and up and up. Everyone then says it's a new paradigm, and then at some point it all comes crashing down. It's, it's, it's gone on throughout history. Um, and, and the other point that Alex picked up at the end, which I think is true, that um, it, it, um, it always catches us unaware. And the reason it catches us unaware, even though 95% of the ingredients are exactly the same, is because it's like the Maginot Line uh, that they built after the First World War to stop the Germans coming through, and the Germans just looked for the weak part, and they found it and they went through in the Ardennes. And um, so if you're ready to get hit in the face and you put on something on the front of your head, next time they'll come and hit you in the back of the head. Um, so all your defenses are fine, they just won't work because it's coming from another way. That's why we never get it. Now speculation is usually at the heart of this. Why? Uh, Pre-1929, as we heard, you could borrow and leverage to ridiculous levels. And if you think back to the property crash in the UK, um, you could often borrow 110% of the money of a property. Then after the crash it got very difficult and now it's getting easier again. So all the signs are that speculation, which is essentially borrowing money you don't own, leveraging it up, and then what happens is the margin call comes. And when the margin call comes, this is the problem of the cash flow versus the balance sheet. So the balance sheet can be trillions, but if you haven't got the cash, then you can't sell those assets in a fire cell for anything other than virtually nothing. And that's always the reality clash. Speculation is not the total cause, it's the state of psychology of investors in the market, of which I am certainly one. And like all the rest of them, I am susceptible to that same psychology. Although occasionally, I listen to distinguished academics and, and practitioners and I go, maybe it's time to get out. So actually, just, just another quick word. The reality of my life today. I'm, I'm a, an upmarket, glass half full type of person. On the other hand, I have a farm. It is wired off. It's got an electric fence. I have CCTV. I have my own solar panel electrical supply. I have my own water supply. I have my own food and vegetables. I have a gun. I'm ex-army and I'm pretty tough. And that's possibly the way I may have to go. But that is my Armageddon and I have cash gold. Gold, physical gold. Because believe me, the value of a Bitcoin on a web system that's crashed or a dollar bill that no one <coughs> trusts is something I'd be suspicious of. So if you like the extremity of one part of my life, that's it. Uh, Alex, Thank you want to say something? I'm not sure what I can add to that. My, my, <laughs> my, my Armageddon planning is not unfortunately as advanced as he is, but I, I'm, I'm a glass half empty guy, so that makes me feel I should have at least two electric fences, really. Um, I think what I'd want to add, I think that nails the, the speculation element today, is just to double down on this point about the coercive effect of low interest rates on absolutely everything. So effectively what's happened is that like Ian's Maginot line example, where the Germans just went round the outside of the line. Last time, the crisis was mainly in the banks. Next time round, it's going to be asset management industry. Um, one of the big developments in the last 10 years has been that there's been a huge growth in passive tracker vehicles. So people think, oh, it's nice and cheap. I can get the amazing performance of the stock market, which is jacked up on steroids provided by the central banks. Uh, really low fee, it just tracks the market, goes up forever. Um, and as people have got more and more desperate for income, they've bought riskier and riskier assets, which are fundamentally illiquid. So rather like a bank account, a bank system works, because not everyone wants to take their money out at the same time. That's true of huge numbers of these funds. And we're going to discover, when the proverbial does hit the fan again, that the funds you think you can get out like Ian's point about huge markdowns in a fire sale, you're not going to be able to sell for love nor money. So we know of credit funds, the corporate debt I was talking about in the presentation, 
where it promises T plus one settlement, that means you sell it, you get your money back the next day, but whose underlying assets take 21 days to sell, even in benign market conditions. There's a fundamental mismatch between people's expectations and reality, and that creates conditions for panic. So panic is the flip side of the coin of speculation, and it's going to happen. Thank you, Alex. Maybe um, we're going to ask, take a few questions from the audience now, um, and then we'll finish up with a last question about regions. But does anyone have any particular questions they'd like to ask? Uh, yeah, sure. Perhaps we start with Patricia and then with you. I don't know how we do this, I think. Yeah, it's working. when um, there were a lot of negative feelings about the equity market in 2016 and then again in December 2018. Do you see equities as carrying on in this bull run or do you and see things like Apple shares carrying on and all these kind of shares or do you think there is going to be a time where we, could, we do see that big downhill? I'll let somebody else answer that. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is even in the midst of crashes, some stocks go up. <coughs> <coughs> and the problem is when money goes into markets in an, a herd-like manner, which is, a, which is indexation uh, as such, it makes no discrimination between good stock and bad stock. When something crashes, you sell that which is most liquid. And so you get out of everything you can sell first. That doesn't mean to say that if you are a smart investor, even during periods of booms, there are many recessions. It, it, it wasn't just a linear progression. And you can alter the level of your portfolio, you can alter the level of leverage, and you can diversify your portfolio. Um, and what is interesting is I, I'm an ex-bullion dealer and interbank foreign exchange trader. Interbank foreign exchange is the most liquid market in the world. I have seen it go completely illiquid. I've seen the bullion market go completely illiquid. I quoted, during a gold crash in the 1970s, I quoted Rothschild a $10, $10 spread in gold. Gold normally trades um, 10 cents differential. And they complained to my boss at the time, and his response was, was anyone else in the world ready to make your market? You had a market, you could trade on it. $10, which was 10% at that time of the total value of gold. So those are the sort of things that happen when panics take place. Um, it's not always easy to protect yourself, but if you are fortunate enough, don't use too much leverage, don't have too many assets which are liquid. It's a bit of an old one, but diversification is still probably one of the free games in town. Okay, so let me take off my academic hat and put on my investor hat. Okay, so if you look at valuations, really what you're asking here is on the one hand, what are valuations today and what is liquidity? Well, liquidity, I think you answered it quite eloquently. Okay, but if you look at valuations today, then you see that in many stock markets, the dividend yield is higher, significantly higher, than the yield on bonds, on government bonds and on corporate bonds. So why is that? That is a function of the distortion in the market. Because we've had financial repression over the last 10, 11 years, where interest rates uh, have been kept artificially low. So as you know, in the UK, you have a dividend yield on the FTSE 100 of 4.8%. And you have yields on the, on the UK yields of 1%. Where do you invest? I mean, we heard it earlier. When you, have a, when you have a yield of 5%, you have capital appreciation. When you have a yield of 1%, you can also have capital appreciation, but the duration is much higher. You can use, lose your shirt, of course. If it yields drop further from 1% to 0 or minus, like in Germany, you have huge capital gains, but you no longer have any income. So as an investor, you have to ask yourself, 
where do you want to position yourself? Do you want to be in stocks that give you good dividend yields and perhaps are sound businesses, and you can ride through these liquidity crises? Because it's really, these are short liquidity shocks, and we have to look at it, why this happens, and I think it's a long discussion and stuff, and so on. But I think from a valuation point of view, I think it explains very nicely why you might want to be in stocks. But then we have to look at the earnings in the earnings season, and if the earnings season comes out uh, it doesn't come out as positive as we expect, and then we're in a pro then we're in a problem. But in 2016-17, I think earnings earnings were very good. Now, I'm, I might get worried, but even they are not that worried because I think valuations still look reasonable. Great. Alex, you want to say something about yeah, that? Can I, I just want to add one thing, and that is that um, Ian's point about selling what's liquid is really important. So. The direct answer to your question is uh, the stock markets could very well go on from here. Liquidity is increasing again from the central banks. If we avoid a recession, there's some kind of um, trade war temporary resolution, then equities might well enjoy further legs. The real danger with markets at the moment is that they are what we believe to be avalanche prone. So I explained about the mismatch between promised liquidity and what we think the reality is. It's also things like machine trading, you know, 75% of the volume of equity trading in North America is machines. The machines drop out and stop providing liquidity just at the moment you most need them, exactly like Ian described in the Forex market. And the reason we focused on something like the credit market is because when one of these seemingly peripheral markets gums up, what people are going to do, regardless almost of the valuation of the equities, is they're going to sell whatever they can to get rid of some risk in their portfolio. And what they'll be able to sell are the big <coughs> liquid names that have done so well in recent history. And we all know what those kind of things are. So that would be our guess that, yes, equities may continue for a bit, and that's why we've still got some. But there's a change of weather that could come very quickly, and it'll be that transmission from something potentially seemingly very minor into something much more significant. Dean wanted to say uh, something. Uh, just quick, a quick question. Yeah, it's all yeah, a bit depressing, isn't it? <laughs> 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 trying to slit your wrist time. But um, two, two things. One is the amount of volatility and instability and uncertainty that we've had over the last two or three years. It can't get any worse. You know, how more unstable can, can it be than it is now is one question. And also, I'm kind of hoping that a lot of these things are priced in to the assets that we talk about because no one is igno ignorant of these risks so surely they are priced in or am I being optimi am, am I too optimistic? I think um, the volatility currently is far less than it was in 1929 and it was in 2008 okay, <coughs> and you can trade volatility they're, they're indexes you can trade volatility mm -hmm. so you can protect yourself with a hedge on actually on the volatility itself right. uh, but the the, uh, the volatility is a, is a two-edged sword. Uh, you can make money on it, but eventually it all heads in one direction at certain times, and then most people lose. I mean, I mean let's get real. If we have a serious crash, yeah, a few smart people are going to make a lot of money on the short side. The bulk of people's um, savings will be destroyed. And what is most important and this was brought out in some of the other presentations, is the political consequences. And we have a situation where the differential in assets and earnings of the rich relative to the average is unsustainable. And believe me, I'm no socialist. I'm pretty right wing. It's unsustainable, particularly in the United States. And the main issue I have with this is where people get paid differential amounts employed, not entrepreneurially made. <coughs> so I have a serious issue when somebody works for a company and gets a salary in multi, multi-millions and bonuses in multi, multi-millions where the differential is too huge. That is going to and does cause social problems. And the repercussions of that, when magnified by a generic crash, could be very, very serious in terms of extreme simplistic parties coming to power. 
and that I think is a is a is a real fear. What can I be optimistic about? You want to be optimistic. Um, I'm a Tottenham fan, so it's difficult to be optimistic. <laughs> 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 but uh, Bernanke did do his PhD on the crash. We have learned a lot. Banks have to hold greater reserves. There are better controls, and all of these things may help, and I hope they do. But I slightly fear they're going to be like a six-foot wall with a tsunami coming at them when they really hit. The, the truth is that volatility is very low by historic standards and has been for a very long time. And that's a function of the fact that central banks have effectively medicated asset <coughs> markets. So low rates, loads of money printing. It's kept things incredibly stable. If you look at the sort of line going up, um, it's remarkable. So in financial terms, this is a very low volatility world. <laughs> well, I share your pessimism, but <laughs> I'm also optimistic, finally, because I think that uh, nowadays we have much of regulation, which many people, of course, uh, suffer from, and today uh, is there's much criticism, uh, criticism about it, but if you think about the situation of the Second World War, um, people learned out of the crisis of the First World War, the Bretton Woods uh, system with the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund was uh, brought up. Um, of course, there was an international trade organization planned, and it uh, was not realized because uh, US uh, did not accept uh, um, this idea completely, but at least the GUT, the general agreement on t uh, tariffs and trade, was uh, the result of it. It was until 1994, until the establishment of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, it was the, um, <coughs> yeah, the agreement um, which uh, yeah, was a kind of international organization handling um, the uh, tariffs and uh, the tax uh, issues. So I think, uh, although I'm also pessimistic on the one side, as I have explained uh, with all the trade wars, I, I focus very much on the trade wars and so um, from the uh, legal point of view. But on the other hand, I'm also a little bit or more optimistic than you are. Although I have also a garden <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a fence, and don't worry, I have it, and I have also solar panels. Um, and you have a gate. I have a gate as well, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember uh, the Swiss one of the few <laughs> countries that still has national service. I think uh, you still have an army, a national service. Yeah, Swiss yeah, yeah we have, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I have also a weapon at home, don't Good. worry. <laughs> you have a weapon at home. <laughs> I, I have another question yeah. from the audience, yeah. Um, so, uh, my question is for you, uh, Professor Karimi, but I'm sure yeah. the rest of the panel will have a, um, a view as well. And I want to pick up on something that you, you said in your, in your talk um, about the US-China. Let's call it a trade dispute as opposed to a trade war. And you said that um, you felt that the partial settlement is unsatisfactory. And I thought perhaps you could unpack that a little bit for us. But also I'd like to lead you in the following way, because I think that potentially Wittingly or unwittingly, <coughs> Donald Trump might be playing a very clever game here. Um, well, um, I agree with you that uh, President Trump is uh, a gambler and he's playing a game. I agree with you. Um, but I also think that he is not really sure about his policy, uh, finally. I think he's switching his policy sometimes. Um, and uh, with regard to the China-US dispute, as you want uh, to call it, um, there are negotiations going on uh, nowadays between uh, China and US uh, exactly on these issues. Uh, of course, you have uh, only today, I have printed out uh, an, um, a newspaper article from uh, Bloomberg where um, the settlement between China and US is in danger, there are mus uh, much risk. But I think finally, as um, Ian um, Iken said, um, Trump will be wise enough not to let uh, down everything. 
Do it's not Ian Iken, it's Carl Iken. Oh, Ian is here. <laughs> Do we have an answer uh, about Trump not being sure about his policies uh, from one of our other speakers? Trump? Yes. Trump is a dangerous moron. <laughs> um, he, he's an incredibly stupid and arrogant man, which is a very bad combination in anybody. Uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, trade rules are good and easy to win. Trade rules are always bad. And what's his experience of winning any of them? Mm -hmm. Having said that, China took the piss for many years. Yeah. Now, let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, previous American administrations did not have the courage to stand up to them. And in his crass, crude way, he has. Mm -hmm. And America is still powerful enough that the Chinese will back off. So they'll probably come to some... Uh, agreement. Yeah. But, but let's be clear about this. This is not untypical of historically what's called the Thucydides trap. This is Sparta, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the Greeks versus the Spartans. America is a population of 365 million people growing at 3% a year. Right? Uh, China is about 1.3 growing at 6% a year. There's only one long-term winner in that. So the United States will eventually not be the predominant economic power in the world. That in itself will cause a major political crisis, probably an economic crisis, and hopefully not a war. Um, and this is just one of the skirmishes. Well, I rather agree with you, but I wasn't, I wasn't about to sort of be this forceful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perhaps we should, oh yeah, one more question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I would like to kind of thank the interesting so far. I would like to gauge your opinion a little bit on, on this uh, topic of machine trading. Yeah? So um, is this, do you see this more as a, a chance of kind of ruling out kind of the psychological behavioral side of humans yeah, who you know, make snap decisions and follow the herd and you know, we, we know Rob Schiller's work on you know, the animal spirits and you know, uh, behavioral economics. Um, or is this the danger that the machines then rule us and push us into a recession we don't actually want and we, could, we can't plug the plug as fast enough? Yeah? Uh, crudely speaking, you, you can trade based on a fundamental analysis of all the data or on the movement of markets and prices by some algorithmic uh, methodology and the jury is out as to which is better at which time. So that's fundamental trading uh, versus index or, or machine trading. <clears throat> the difficulty with machine trading, it doesn't think. And when a large volume of money follows it, ironically, it creates arbitrage for the fundamental trader to, to take advantage. But machines themselves and the algorithms are created by humans. So, so to a certain extent, they're, 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 not, they're full of bias and prejudice, and they will do, they create a false sense of liquidity which will disappear when we have an extreme situation in markets. So I don't think they are the cause themselves, but I think they could be a catalyst when we have a problem. They also I I exacerbate things in a spectacular way. Um, there's some work recently done by Peter Thiel's team that suggests that once you go over 50% of the market controlled by machine index trading, everything in that category, that becomes the principal driver of the market. It's not um, the active managers who have sway, it's the machines directing money after everything. And what I was talking about was the way that there are different phases in history. We've been in a particularly benign one in financial terms. The machines are not going to have any idea that tomorrow we go into a radically new world of fiscal spending, populism, high taxation, certain industries getting battered. There will always be space for human beings with that kind of editorial control. Great. Let me tell you a joke. Can I tell you a joke? <laughs> <laughs> so remember when we had the crisis with the Greek economy? So there's a story of middle of the afternoon, Greek guy and his wife and family and friends turn up at a restaurant, order the best food, order the best wine, have a great time. Seven o'clock in the evening, German guy turns up, spent all, all day at work, hard working, orders some bread, orders some water, comes the bill and the Greek guy says, send it to him. <laughs> it's a joke, okay. Well, it's good that just for the latter part of, of this panel maybe, Actually, it's good that you've mentioned Greece just now because we've obviously talked about the United States uh, for now a lot, but 
what do we see uh, maybe um, similarities between the United States and maybe Europe? And do we feel that there are any particular areas which are more vulnerable to a new crash? That's just to finish this, if you'd like to discuss this between you. Um, did you finish the joke? I did, yeah, I did. Okay. That was a joke. <laughs> I did, I did, I did. did. That, that, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> I'll, I'll take the second point. Let me, let me finish the point. There's a philosophical element to the joke. I used to be uh, an advisor to the OECD Finance Committee. And um, I can remember the Germans sent, as they do, they sent people from their central bank and their treasury. And their view is, because they've got a memory of the crisis of 29, because remember, <coughs> it hurt them more than anyone else in the end. Strong currency, and you don't leverage, and you don't borrow, and you don't do all the things you can't afford. And that's their view. And the Greeks were wasteful, helped by Goldman Sachs leveraged everything, and they should not be bailed out. And I said to them, what happened to you, and the, you mentioned before, what happened to you in Versailles? You Thank can't you. take an economy, take away a big chunk of its industrial capacity, reduce it by 25%, and then make it pay back the same debt. So you may not like it, <coughs> but if you want to help those economies grow, the point being that we all have different perspectives of other people's problems from our own position. The quick question to your other thing is, it always happens further and faster in the United States. Europe is slower. Europe is not integrated. Europe only has one financial center of relevance, which is London. <laughs> um, still, um, Germany and France are a joke in terms of financial centers. Um, so it will happen in America. It always does. Do you have any other, maybe perhaps Alexander, you'd like to speak about if you feel that any geographic area is vulnerable uh, to a crash? Uh, the Eurozone is still acutely vulnerable. Um, it doesn't have fiscal transfers. There's no pooled sovereign debt instruments. Uh, the markets could still pick off regional debt markets. Um, and it's very difficult to see with the political winds as they are how that's going to change. So I would say the Eurozone is... Um, I usually show a slide with magazine covers, for example, from 1979 Business Week saying the death of equities <coughs> just before the biggest bull run in history <laughs> kicks off. Um, and it's usually when everyone assumes something's certain and rock solid that it's the moment of near disaster. Draghi said recently the Eurozone uh, business complete, effectively it's rock solid. I wouldn't be so sure. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? for closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gianfranco Vento. I'm the director of the Center for Applied Finance and Banking. And this is the first event organized by this new established center. Uh, we used to have a similar center in the past. but uh, uh, So I'm very proud of, uh, I'm very happy to uh, have had the chance to host you here. And uh, um, I enjoyed a lot uh, the, the seminar, the presentations, and the discussion of, of the panel. Um, well, I mean, I I what we learned from uh, the 1929 financial crisis and from the other crises that have been mentioned in the, in the presentation, the, the great financial crisis is the, is the, is the easiest one to, to, to remind, also because it's rel relatively recent. Uh, well, in the past crisis, uh, uh, authorities had a, a very significant role, as uh, all the, uh, the presenters said. Uh, probably the, the Federal Reserve was not um, very proactive uh, when the crisis started uh, in 29, and uh, uh, monetary policy played a very important role in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the great financial crisis before 2007. We had a, a relatively long period of uh, negative real interest rates uh, in the United States and also uh, very low interest rates in the Eurozone. So uh, for sure, uh, authorities uh, uh, made some mistakes. Um, also, also in terms of uh, regulators and supervisors, uh, so not everything went, uh, went smooth. I mean, uh, banks were adopting um, business model, wrong business models originate to distribute, <coughs> which uh, increased uh, quite a lot risk appetite. And uh, uh, shadow banking is also something which has not been mentioned, but uh, it represent, uh, used to represent and still represent a very big uh, danger for, for the stability of the financial system and uh, of the economy as a whole. Uh, 
um, what happened after, uh, 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 on the other hand, what happened after those crises occurred? Uh, um, nowadays, we can say we have a, uh, probably a more effective regulation uh, in, in the banking system, which is, uh, uh, which is trying to avoid other financial crises to occur. Uh, but this has some consequences, for, uh, of course. I mean, uh, uh, banks' profitability nowadays is much lower than 15 day years ago. And this is the price we, we all are paying for uh, having a safer banking system, a safer financial system. On the other hand, uh, uh, this expansive monetary policy, as uh, all the panelists said, is uh, uh, generating too much liquidity, too low interest rates, negative rates, which was something uh, unthinkable a few years ago. Uh, and, uh, and also this generates a, a, a wrong a dangerous allocation of, of resources. So uh, this is something that, uh, uh, as everyone said, is, ge is generate a bubble and the bubble is likely to snap at some point. So uh, the reform regulatory framework uh, uh, made for sure the financial system safer but less profitable. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, may doesn't make everyone happy, of course. I mean, uh, on one hand, regulators and supervisory authorities uh, are, uh, are quite happy because the system is safer. But on the other hand, uh, the, the banking industry, the financial industry, is, uh, is paying a quite high price for, uh, for this. And uh, um, what the 1929 crisis told <coughs> us uh, also is that uh, uh, um, the panelists mentioned this in, in, in an indirect way, uh, that uh, the, the distinction between commercial banking and investment banking, and I think Jacob in a way uh, mentioned this, is something that uh, uh, we always have, uh, have to bear in mind. I mean, there's no uh, a very uh, a clear literature say, uh, saying which business models for banks uh, is the best, and probably, probably, uh, on one hand, we know that there are many advantages in having uh, universal banks uh, which can offer a large variety of products and services. But on the other hand, uh, we, we also know that, uh, that uh, if banks, uh, if commercial banks uh, are so much involved in investment banking, uh, this can, can generate uh, uh, many risks and a, 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 a misallocation of, uh, of resources. So more generally, we, we can conclude that uh, uh, the financial system, uh, if the financial system is not properly regulated and, uh, and the risk appetite of uh, agents is too high, uh, this can, can bring to uh, another financial crisis. And uh, uh, unfortunately, there is a, a trade-off between profitability and the stability uh, of, uh, of the financial industry. So, so um, I think uh, authorities, uh, uh, didn't didn't solve this uh, this uh, issue uh, in full. Um, I I'm very grateful with the with the with the speakers with the with the panel for the great contribution they gave uh, uh, in this discussion, and uh, I'm very grateful to all of you who were here till uh, 7 p.m. And uh, I hope to have to see you again in other events that the center is going to organize in the in 2020. Thank you very much. <laughs>